Hello there and uh, welcome to a wet, rainy Monday morning. It's beautiful out there, TNT, but as always, uh, please be extra cautious in anything that you do because the weather, Mother Nature is uh, crying this morning and crying very heavily. And I wonder why, I wonder if it's because uh, Mother Nature is a West Indian fan and last night uh, probably dictates uh, heartbreak and in many instances, uh, a lack of sleep for West Indian supporters. Uh, as uh, the West Indies uh, fought hard uh, and fought ferociously, but uh, the game coming down to the final over South Africa won by three wickets. So West Indies are eliminated South Africa through to the semi-finals of the ICC Men's T20 World Cup. Uh, perhaps not the best way or the most invigorating way to start your day. So let me wake you up. The Prime Minister has hinted at the possibility of a earlier than expected general election. Now, the rumor I was hearing was that it may be before budget. If he is to do that, he has to call it by the end of July. But uh, hints being given at the PNM Sports CSC. We'll get into all of that later on. The other part of the news over the weekend that probably uh, really shook you was that magnitude 6.2 earthquake. And boy, oh boy. <laughs> It felt like sleeping on one of those old, you know, like the really, really old time uh, bed stands. You know, you know when you just lie on on, on, on that, and no matter how much you toss and turn, you just <laughs> it felt like an earthquake. Six point two. And by the way, that's the fourth major earthquake within the last few months, according to the U.S. Seismic Research Center. But again, we'll get into that later on because we're going to start off with a more stimulating conversation, need I say a more constructive conversation, one that can help society. We're always talking about starting from the bottom, starting from the root, and in TNT it starts not just with primary schools, but with ECCE. And the Ministry of Education has actually uh, started this adopt a school program. It's not new, it's been around since 2020. Um, but however, we're trying to stimulate that a bit more. So I welcome to the program, usually at 6.30, but joining us at the very top of this morning, Mr. Walter Stewart, the uh, president of the NPTA. Good morning, sir. Welcome to the program. Good morning um, and good to be here. Um, um, it's, of course, rainy Monday, as you did say. So I really wish all our viewers and, of course, Fernando Tobago a really good week. Of course, this is um, SCA Results Week. This coming Friday. Oh, yes. So um, about 19,000 of our students are anxiously awaiting the results on Friday. And to them, we wish all the best. Um, they won't all pass to their first choice, obviously. But of course, whatever school you are assigned to, give it your best shot. Do you think that, that you know, people say you, uh, when you pa don't pass for your first choice, you know, it's a good or bad school. Do you think it's also up to the students? I mean, they may not pass for their first choice but it's still an opportunity that they can utilize. Certainly, because listen, all the schools are guided by the same curriculum. And of course, once our teachers are properly trained, and of course the delivery of the curriculum is intact, there's no excuse really for our students not to do their very best. Of course, there needs to be clinical supervision, and there needs to be assessment of the students from term to term, from form to form. And of course, I believe firmly in my heart that once the students put their shoulders to the wheel, they can accomplish their goals at the end of five years. Indeed, indeed. Well, as Mr. Stewart said, all the very best to students uh, as SE results are due to be announced on Friday. But as we get into the Adopt a School program, which, which has been around since uh, September of 2020, so just we're looking at the period of uh, COVID-19 actually, right. uh, and when we were working, when we were all working from home. Mm -hmm. And the Adopt a School program really focuses on supporting educational needs of students, right. but also helps facilitate greater education with infrastructure, beautification of schools, uh, you know, digital transformation, as I mentioned. Yeah. But in regard to the, the thrive uh, and the thrust that existed when this was uh, first announced, yeah. have we seen the true potential? Well, let me say that um, education is good business, as I want to use the line from the Minister of Education when she relaunched the Adopter School program in February of this year. Um, the government, Kitan, cannot do it alone. Mm -hmm. And of course, whilst the budget allocates the major share sometimes to the Ministry of Education, I think 2024 fiscal, um, they allocated $8.2 billion and the previous year $7.4 billion. The government cannot do it alone. So of course, a lot has to be relied upon and depended upon by the corporate citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Hence the reason for the Adopt a School program. Um, our concern, the NCPTA's concern, is really that there has to be a needs assessment 
to be able to understand what the needs of the schools are. And of course, to be able to filter, not necessary finances only, but other resources into that particular school or schools in order to be able to adopt a school and to give them the needed help and support that the school needs. Now, this needs-based assessment will be uh, per school. It can't just be a blanket assessment. Exactly, exactly so, per and, school. But, but generally speaking, across TNT, you said the government can't do it alone. Right. What do you think is, is the main issue or the main need of most schools? Well, there are so many needs, eh? and of course the priority list is very long. Um, but when you look at some of the infrastructure in our schools, many of our schools, Kitan, are aged schools. So that there needs to be a physical infrastructural development program for our schools. Especially when you think of if we are going to e-exams, for example, and you look at the electrical loading of the schools, for example, there needs to be an intervention in all our schools across the board to ensure that they can take the load, electrical load mm -hmm. of air conditioning, um, the computers, the laptops, etc., and the technical devices in order to be able to commit to e-exams. So that I would think that um, the infrastructure needs to be given top priority. This is a time, July, August vacation, when there's always that mad rush to ensure that our schools are up and running and in time for the September academic year opening. So that um, infrastructure is always one of the primary concerns of our schools at all material times. Now, this Adopt School program ties into the corporate social responsibility message and the ESG message that the NCPT has been pushing over the last few months here during their segments. But the thing is, how do we now get uh, corporate entities to buy into this? How do we get them to understand that there's benefits for them as well? Right. Now, there is this school-based management program or the school-based management model which was introduced several years ago. And of course, it brings together a number of stakeholders, including, of course, community and corporate engagement. So that put to use and properly engaged, this school-based management program, which looks at leadership, governance, integrated management of the school, put to proper use, the stakeholder, the corporate citizen, is already in on the program and can make a meaningful contribution in terms of, as I said before, what are the needs of the school and how they can fit into making sure that the needs of that school are particularly engaged and of course how they can assist the school in whatever which way. But the thing is, is that a lot of corporate entities may not see the benefit to this. They, they may say that, okay, it is a donation, we're pushing it yeah. towards a, an education policy. Fair enough, but uh, what are we gaining from it in return? Got you. I made the point several um, weeks ago with regards to the direct correlation of corporate involvement in education. Listen, most of the students who are leaving our schools this year and entering into the world of work would have had to have some kind of beginning. And of course, the employer wants to ensure that the cohorts of students coming out can fit the bill in order to make sure that their bottom line is well enhanced. So that if corporate Trinidad and Tobago invest substantial sums of money into ensuring that the education of our students are well placed, they are the ones who are going to be the beneficiaries of these students in the employer. So the student who is honest, hardworking, puts a lot of effort and emphasis on the job, comes to work on time, is disciplined, etc. All these are attributes that would lead towards the bottom line of the corporate citizen. So it is in your best interest, the employer, to ensure that you put in maximum amount of finances and support resources into the education system in order to ensure that at the end of the day, my employee, the person who is coming out of the school into my job, is going to be able to give me that kind of support I need to ensure that my bottom line is well enhanced. So based on what you said, you are of the opinion that currently there is a lot of leakage. Of course, certainly, certainly. And of course, if the corporate sits down with the NCPTA and all the other stakeholders as well, we can see exactly how they could advance their own cause for the benefit of those students. So it's really a win-win situation for all parties on board. So uh, have you had success actually having those conversations with corporate Um entity? Let me say that we started in Tobago with the Tobago Chamber. And of course, it is our intention to be able to attack or invite all the other business chambers to Trinidad and Tobago um, to come to the table and to have these discussions with us so that we can be able to be a part of the discussions with them. 
um, and see how best we can rule out the program and make it effective and efficient throughout Trinidad and Tobago in our schools. But generally, has it been challenging? Um, it has been challenging at my DSA. Um, um, as I said, let us use the Tobago model as an example and let's see where that takes us. So far, it has been quite encouraging. And of course, we want to come down now into Trinidad and be able to enhance and to use and to engage Trinidad corporate citizens into the same model that we're using for Tobago. Do you think all schools need to benefit uh, from some form or the other of the adopt -a school program? Or is it just specific? Well, I might say that there are other organizations attached to some schools. Some schools have very active and robust alumni associations. So of course, they are well endowed, let me use that terminology. But of course, there is always need for more. I think in all those schools, be it in teacher training, for example, be it in human resource development, for example, even something as simple as writing resumes. I mean, our students can be um, assisted from corporate citizens in helping to write resumes, proper resumes as well. Clinical supervision is necessary, and of course, if our corporate citizens can assist as well in even putting in some funds to assist and bringing in private organizations into our schools to assist with that part of the um, effort, it would be well, well appreciated. Now, in respect to this particular education policy, you do see it how, uh, being, if the potential is truly recognized, transforming right. uh, the education system. Yeah, and of course, more than that, national development as well would be a byproduct of all that as well. So that even if we engage the Ministry of Planning in our discussions, we can see how best corporate assistance and corporate involvement and engagement can also help to pivot our national development throughout Trinidad and Tobago. But do you have any, any suggestions as to how this can be improved or this particular education policy to see more penetration? You mean with the corporate organizations, for example? Yeah. Well, as I said, if we implement the school-based management program where the corporate citizen is also a part of that program, that, of course, can be realized with great success, great level of success. So I know that we spoke about the NPT and their efforts in respect to corporate social responsibility and their engagements, for example, with the Tobago Business Chamber. Right. But in, in directly to the adopt a school program, does the NCPT have any role to play? Well, except for us being invited to the meeting in February, there has been no other overtures to the NCPT. Um, and I think probably we, it is probably opportune for us to now put on the table by means of recommendations and suggestions how we think we can now play a critical role in the adopt -a school program, similar to some of the um, um, issues I raised with you earlier. So I so think that it is probably at this time that we need to make overtures to the government. So currently the it's more so advocacy than anything else. Exactly, certainly. But yeah, how do you think that the NCPT can play a more critical role? Um, by getting involved in the business chambers, for example, and of course calling them, as I said before, to a meeting, a roundtable meeting, so that we can tell them what, how we can see their role being deepened and being more enhanced in terms of assisting the um, adopted school and being more involved in the adopted school program. Have there been any examples that we can speak of in respect to CSRs and adopted school program? Well, let me say, um, let me use a program in Antigua to start with and to see how we can now integrate that same program in Trinidad and Tobago. Last year, um, April to June, the Antigua Barbuda Workers Union had, a internship, had an internship program where they took on board students to be able to show them the world of work. So of course it is two pound, expose them to the world of work and of course giving them some experience as well in the world of work. We want to be able to have that same internship program among our students here in Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, starting again with the model in Tobago, for example, where we can ask our corporate Tobago citizens to open up their places of work, of work, for example, and invite students to come in and understand how the world of work is. And I'm talking about probably fourth formers, fifth formers, of course, without pay, because of course there's child labor as well. But of course, it's just to get your feet wet as to what the world of work is involved in, and also how they can gain experience in the world of work. Because I tell you, many times when you have your resume, and of course there are vacancies, the issue is work experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it be, well, I mean, it bewilders me how a student now leaving school can even have work experience when you are now leaving school, for example. But if you have the internship program and they get a feel of what the work experience is all about, they can adequately or, or, or definitely put that on their resumes 
um, and that could be a plus. Believe you me, I, I very much understand where you're coming from. I read exactly. some of these job descriptions and what they're looking for, and I'm like, you're kidding, right? Exactly. You, you understand what you're looking for, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, but this is the thing. Okay, so let's simplify it a bit further, and, and that's sure. a very good example. Mm -hmm. Do you think that more summer internships being advertised or made available can actually have greater benefit down there? If you're speaking about, uh, for example, that level of experience that you can put on your resume. Six, you know, you can be work for two months over the, exactly. the course of the, you know, yeah. and you do that for three years, form ones, mm. form, sorry, form five, six, gotcha. you know, two years. Yeah. Do you think that is something that, that, that really needs to be focused on a bit more? I think so, and I think it will have um, tremendous success. But do you think and we have the capacity for that? Well, again, the citizens, the corporate citizens need to understand the need for that and, of course, be able to embody that as part of their work attitude and of course what of course they want to see in the world of work mm -hmm. if they can realize the benefit of that both to themselves and of course the students but of course the intern it is going to be um, um, well accepted the thing is though the world of work program seems to start more so in university i mean ue has their own world of work yeah. fair it's, mm -hmm. it's i think it's two days or three days long yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and students gain benefits from, yeah, that, from that, whether yeah, it be so through resume yeah. writing, advice, yeah. or even their first, their very first job from graduating from university. Right. However, it's not something, you just use an example, this is something that you're seeing in, exactly. in Antigua, for example, yeah. where students get their feet wet. That's not yeah. something we see down here. Not at all. And it's something that we should probably now try to inculcate in our system here and begin to to make sure that our students get that exposure at an early age. But do you think that some students, and, and there, there's a potential to the real their education as well. They say, okay, listen, I, I, I could probably get this job now at this age. I don't need to continue any further with my education. Do you think that's a possibility as well? Well, yeah, it is possible, but of course, we really would want to make sure that the majority of our students understand the need for that um, as they enter the world of work. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, Mr. Stewart, as we're coming to the end of this particular conversation, I mean, what more do you want to see happening in respect to the N uh, NCPT and their role uh, in regard to the adopt to school program. You guys are, are, are strong advocates. You've yeah. raised some very good points and examples this yeah. morning, mm -hmm. but we can't just have conversations. Exactly. You know, it exactly. needs to be more than conversation. Yeah, listen, I think that we need to sit down with the Ministry of Education because see what you may, um, if we do not get the buy-in and the support of the Ministry of Education in our initiatives, we are but just having hot air. So, of course, if we sit down with the Ministry of Education and the technocrats and be able to roll out to them what our position is on this particular adopted school program, I think cohesively and collaboratively we can accomplish on the Ministry of Education side, of course, and of course the NCPTA side, exactly what we have been um, trying to advocate, and of course, what they have in mind as well for this adopted school program. Do you get tired, though, of the conversations? Do you sometimes feel as though your conversations are, are not bearing the fruit? <laughs> Well, tired might be an understatement. Um, sometimes you think you're banging against a wall um, with some of your ideas and your concepts. And of course, it's really to get somebody to listen and to buy into what you have and what your um, ideals are for this organization. Because there is not only, it's not only about the NCPTA, it's really about the holistic total national development that is really our concern. Uniting home and school to ensure that every child materializes and achieves their full potential. That's see, all in. See, see, the thing is, the most successful people never give up. Ah, so thank you very that, much. Yeah. That may be the uh, attitude that needs to be adopted more often. Yeah, yep, 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 yep. And knocking on the doors <laughs> of where it matters most as well. Well, where it matters we most, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you've got to see to where it matters. That. Yeah. Indeed. Mr. Stewart, I want to thank you very much for sure. joining us once more on the program. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, as we're speaking most about corporate social responsibility, uh, in conjunction with the adopt school program sure. before we leave i would ask you if you can just uh, reiterate how people can get in contact with the ncpt should they feel uh, that they want to do more that they have a, a bigger role to play good so that um we are on facebook um i want to give my personal number as well six eight two six eight three two and of course we can be contacted by our email nptatnt at gmail.com our office is located at the ascos building in st joseph um, and these are means by which you can contact us. Again, my personal number, 682-6832, Walter Stewart, National PTA President. Thank you very much, sir. All the very Take best. Care. The very same. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, we take a break here on AM Prime. We will return shortly.
back to AM Prime, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being with us this morning as we continue the conversation. So I'm going to take the opportunity now with the time that we have uh, to share some information with you. As you are probably aware, and I, I hope you are at this time, uh, there seems to be a dengue outbreak here in TNT. It's, it's not just specific to TNT. It is happening around the Caribbean and South America as well. But focusing here on TNT in particular, uh, there has been one confirmed death. That uh, confirmation coming from the Minister of Health in respect to dengue fever here in TNT. As we are aware, the dengue virus is actually spread uh, through uh, mosquitoes. Uh, even in questions surrounding uh, how come the, the spraying of areas, you, you know, the, a while back, years ago, trucks used to pass in your neighborhood. You see that loud noise, and they were actually spraying uh, for dengue fever, for mosquitoes on a whole. That was the vector controls on the part of, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development. Don't know what's happening with that. Seems to be no answers surrounding what's taking place with that. But in the meantime, you need to protect yourself. You need to safeguard yourself. And the, and the question is really, how come more than ever dengue is spreading in places it did not exist in before? Yes, dengue, we, we've had dengue outbreaks in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, but it's popping up more and more places that it has not really been prevalent before. The World Health Organization actually created a video uh, to address that, and they published it uh, just about two months ago. I'm gonna share that video with you now uh, to have a better understanding as to what is taking place uh, in respect to the dengue fever spreading, as well as the symptoms, treatments, possibly vaccines. I know that's a bit of a buzzword in TNT. Let's take a look at this video from the World Health Organization. Why is dengue fever back in news again? Why are we seeing it in areas where it did not exist before? And what about treatment? What about vaccination? Here to talk about all of this is Dr. Raman Velayudan. Welcome, Raman. Talk to us about dengue fever. What causes it and how does it spread? Dengue fever is a virus fever uh, caused by the bite of uh, Aedes mosquito. In majority of the cases, these are mild symptoms with body pain, headache, and rashes, which last for a few weeks. However, about 5% of the cases are severe, where the patient needs hospital care. The main symptoms of severe dengue are vomiting, bleeding of the gums, plasma leakage, and sometimes organ failures. These cases need to be managed in the hospital to prevent death. However, most of the patients uh, recover from it, but delay in admission can cause uh, unnecessary fatalities. So in many cases, the patient takes time to come, and that delay is a crucial point. Dengue is transmitted from one person to the other by the bite of the mosquito. You know, when I was growing up in New Delhi, I never heard about dengue until a certain point, and then dengue cases started appearing. We're seeing it in places where it did not exist before, like Spain or Bhutan. Why is this happening? Well, dengue is spread very fast, mainly because of international travel and the adaptation of the mosquito into an urban pocket. Climate change is yet another factor which has contributed to the spread of dengue. And this has two extremes where the, the flooding of areas also causes mosquitoes to multiply. But at the same time, if there is scarcity of water, the mosquitoes manage to survive in containers of stored water. So the more water you store, the more uh, areas for it to breed. So this has all helped the mosquito to adapt and spread the disease to newer, newer areas and new countries. Over 100 countries are endemic for this disease and approximately 4 billion people are at risk of it. The mosquito uh, has adapted so well that it is continuing to spread to newer areas where the climatic conditions are suitable. Are there any treatments or vaccine? Does that work for dengue fever? There are currently no treatment for dengue. Most of the cases are managed at home, mainly to prevent the main symptoms of dengue, which are fever or your joint pains. So tablets are given for controlling that. Paracetamol is given as a medicine for this, while ibuprofen and aspirin are discouraged since that can lead to bleeding. 
currently there is only one vaccine which is approved and that is recommended for age group between 6 to 16 in high transmission setting. There are several new developments which includes better diagnostic kits, medicines and mosquito control tools. They will be made available as their studies and results are published. Currently, there are no other effective uh, methods which are in use, but we are using traditional methods to control the mosquitoes. Raman, talk to us about why dengue fever is so hard to control and how can we protect ourselves? The Dengue fever is hard to control because this mosquito has adapted extremely well to urban centers. Secondly, their eggs can remain dry for several months and hatch as soon as they come in contact with water. Thirdly, this mosquito is continuing to spread to newer areas where conditions are favorable to them, and this includes urban and semi-urban pockets. The dengue mosquito bites during the daytime. Hence, we have to protect ourselves with repellents and other personal protection measures. So before we go to work or before children go to school, they must be provided with repellents so they are protected from the bite of these mosquitoes. Other measures include preventing mosquito breeding in and around your homes, covering your water storage containers, and at the same time, those who have dengue or people who tend to sleep during the day should use a mosquito net. Thank you, Raman. That was Science in 5 today. Until next time. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we thank the World Health Organization for playing their role in educating us. And of course, we hope that, uh, that uh, you've taken some lesson from the video that was presented uh, by the WHO. Uh, but a lot of what we're experiencing now, it, it's going to continue. Such trends are going to continue. And in a conversation that we had last week, these things are actually going to become more and more unpredictable mainly because of climate change. As the environment changes, everyone has to adapt, including animals and plants. And, you know, within the last few weeks, global warming more than ever has become more and more a topic that people are discussing because of the extreme heat waves felt across the world. In fact, Saudi Arabia has uh, suggested that over 1,300 people have died following the Hajj pilgrimage. Many of them walking in the heat for days without appropriate shelter or hydration. Most recently, a gentleman was actually lost in the forest, I think somewhere in the United States, which is a battling extreme heat waves. He survived by having to drink up to one gallon of fresh water. Bear in mind, it's not purified. So he took a huge risk there as well, just to try and stay alive because of the heat wave that is being experienced. In fact, tourists in Greece have actually succumbed to extreme heat, which Greece has become accustomed to, but it's happening a lot earlier than anticipated. So the thing is, many parts of the world are currently experiencing above average temperatures, above average temperatures, meteorologists saying because of global warming. Some areas are actually seeing colder conditions, which is not expected, and far, far more regions are enduring temperatures described as being quite a lot warmer than normal. So let's take a look at this report compiled uh, by the BBC that hopefully answers some of the questions as to exactly what's happening and is this going to continue? Welcome to the programme. We're going to start with the extreme weather that's being experienced across four continents, a sign that climate change may again help push temperatures beyond the record-breaking heat last summer. In Saudi Arabia, there are reports that more than a 1,000 people have died, pilgrims at the annual Hajj festival, killed by the stifling heat. We'll have more on that in just a moment. In India, there have been several deaths in the capital, Delhi. Temperatures are reaching more than 50 degrees Celsius. In Europe, temperatures have also risen, with Greece experiencing its earliest ever summer heat wave. And in the United States, there are wildfires on one coast, made worse with high temperatures, and a tropical storm brewing on the other. Well, scientists from the World Weather Attribution have uh, released a report today saying that human-induced climate change made recent extreme heat in the US southwest, Mexico and Central America, around 35 times more likely. In their new report, scientists said such a heat wave was now four times more likely than it was in the year 2000, driven by planet warming emissions. Let's speak to Roop Singh, head of urban and attribution at the uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Centre. Her team helped develop the report. Thank you for coming on the programme. 
Absolutely. So just talk us through the headlines here. Yeah, so um, the heat wave that we saw in Central and uh, Central America and North America um, is just evidence of the climate change that we're seeing around the world. Um, in our attribution study, we found that climate change made the, the maximum ten temperatures 35 times more likely and the nighttime temperatures up to 200 times more likely. And that's really significant because it's really the nighttime temperatures when your body is supposed to rest and recover that has impacts on human health. And that's what's actually causing a lot of these heat related deaths. And just remind us of the mechanism here. What is happening in what is heating what to lead to these temperatures? Yeah, so we know that um, climate change is caused by increasing greenhouse gases and essentially those greenhouse gases act to warm the planet around the world, but they're also act acting to sort of supercharge weather systems. So we're starting to see these heat domes and essentially heat stick around for an extended period of time um, in different parts of the world. We saw that in uh, Mexico and Central America, and we're also starting to see that now um, in the northern and eastern parts of the United States. So you said heat dome there. Just expand on that a little for us. What is it? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, it's an area of high pressure. It's a place where you have um, not a lot of clouds, not a lot of rainfall, but essentially um, you just have high temperatures that stick around for, for days and days. And essentially, that the... The duration of that heat causes a lot of impacts both on infrastructure but also on people. And people just aren't able to cope when it's hot during the day and at night continuously for, for days on end. So people are going to have to try and adapt now. Is it possible, before we get on to adaptations, is it possible to predict where and when this is going to happen? So we have heat wave early warning systems and we have um, typically lots of warning before a heat wave occurs. And so um, in most parts of the world, we are able to predict what the maximum temperatures are going to be days in advance. And therefore, um, it actually is a big opportunity for us to be able to use that information to reduce the impacts, to warn people in advance of the heat waves. OK, so if the warnings could be in place, what then? What can people actually do? What should governments actually do? So there's individual action, so es essentially cooling yourself, making sure that you're drinking water, um, cooling your home, so passive cooling technologies, um, shading your homes, um, making sure you're planting trees outside, or just closing the shades when it's really hot is what people can do. But then you also have organizations like the Red Cross where we're providing first aid for people who are affected by heat stroke, for example, helping people recognize the signs of heat-related illnesses, and take action before it's too late. And then, of course, um, cities and governments can work to together to develop heat action plans. And that means essentially knowing what they're going to do, what services are they going to provide when there is a heat wave. Are they going to open up a cooling center? Are they going to uh, distribute water, ensuring that people have adequate access to electricity, which they need in order to cool their homes um, during a heat wave? Roop Singh, thank you very much for coming on the programme. Thank you. Thanks. Right, we're going to take a closer look at what's happening with the weather in the United States. Now our correspondent, Nomi Iqbal, is in Washington, D.C. Hi, Nomi. Just talk us through what's happening. Well, Lewis, today is officially the first day of summer, and what a start. You've got more than a quarter of the population that's under an excessive heat advisory, and generally 135 million people are impacted. And temperatures have hit more than 90 degrees Fahrenheit and are expected to go well over 100 uh, from the Ohio Valley to the Mid-Atlantic, right up to New England. I mean, Maine, if you think about that, that's the easternmost state in the U.S., doesn't usually get excessive heat, but it's thought that records will be broken there. Um, and in some parts of uh, on the east coast like new york city school is out for some uh, a lot of schools uh, closed up uh, today to let children go home early uh, because of the excessive heat. Uh, over on the West Coast, we're seeing these wildfires break out. And it's worth mentioning that this happens, but it's happening more frequently with more ferocity. Uh, two people were killed in New Mexico. And, you know, we heard that uh, some of the advice that's been given, and generally the advice is, especially for vulnerable people, children, the 
elderly, those who work outdoors, especially here, you see them like a lot of construction workers in parts of DC, to just really look after yourself, seek shade, make sure you drink lots of water. Here in DC, it's it's about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. There is some cloud cover, so it doesn't feel as, as sort of as stuffy and, and swampy and stifling as it has been in the past few days. But the temperatures here are expected to hit uh, over, 100 and, over 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, uh, um, during the weekend. And there will be some respite. So meteorologists reckon that the temperatures might dip, dip low, but then they will come right back, back up again uh, next week and onwards. And Anna, given everything you've just talked about there, has this seeped into the political discourse? Any uh, reaction from authorities? Well, it's usually the same sort of you know messages that we get: is just keep safe, you know, as much as you can. Um, you know, it's it's kind of sort of follow the common sense advice. But as I mentioned, for those who are in a certain group children, the elderly, those who work outside, need to work outside all day, just just manage that, you know, drink as much water as possible, get shade where you can. There are like lots of trees around here in DC, you know, we're sort of standing under one so we can get some shade, but just try and uh, you know, look after yourself in that way. There are also those vulnerable people who take certain kinds of medicine that you really can't regulate in this kind of heat, so it's, you know, warnings for them as well so that that's just generally the advice look it always gets hot in dc i have to say you know i've been here for a few years and every summer it's really really hot i think this the prediction is that it's going to get much much hotter so just you know really heed that advice oh, yeah, thank you so much for that These all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we see what's happening across the world. Thank you very much uh, to uh, BBC for that uh, report, uh, giving uh, further insights, of course. Uh, uh, in the midst of all this uh, global warming, as I said, uh, climate change has obviously caused havoc in many areas. One of the biggest impacts we're feeling in the Caribbean, would you believe it or not, is seaweed. Yes, so gasm seaweed is invading the Caribbean. Barbados, for example, is feeling it particularly badly uh, because it's affecting their fishing industry. Other islands throughout the Caribbean are feeling it pretty badly because it's affecting tourism. And I often ask myself when I drive along the coast of Tobago and, and many beaches are overrun with sargassum seaweed in Tobago, by the way, it's very difficult to even access the beach, to even access the way you could stand on the shore. That's the reality of the situation. And it's blooming in such high volumes because of a warmer climate and warmer temperatures that benefits the seaweed. But I often wonder, there must be some benefit to this. For example, I'm asking myself, there must be some benefit to Saharan dust, and apparently there is. It's full of nutrients for plants. It really actually helps nourishes uh, and fertilizes the soil. So there is some benefit to that, but what's the benefit to seaweed? And the thing is, is that sometimes if there's no scientific benefit, you can probably find a benefit for yourself. As is exemplified in Mexico, where they're actually using the seaweed to turn it into bricks. Now, last year, Sean Michael Small and I showed you a video of which in Barbados, they were using the seaweed to turn it into fertilizer. But now they're finding more and more ways to utilize, well, something that's really affecting everyone and microeconomies. Well, they're turning this into an opportunity themselves. Let's take a look at this video from Business Insider in respect to sargassum seaweed and bricks. These bricks are made from seaweed. The secret is sargassum, an invasive species washing up and rotting on beaches around North America. The massive waves can lead to respiratory problems and can cost millions to clean up. But where most people see a problem, Omar Vasquez saw potential. He turns the seaweed into bricks strong enough to build homes that he says can withstand hurricanes. Lo primero que pensé fue empezar a donar casas, ya que mi madre, mis hermanos y yo nunca tuvimos un techo propio. Omar and his family immigrated to the U.S. with nothing in their pockets when he was just eight years old. Now, he uses his bricks to build homes for low-income families, like the Lopez's. Could this invention help other countries clean up their coastlines? 
we went to Mexico to see how entrepreneurs like Omar are making the most out of a stinky situation. Omar and his team start collecting the seaweed at 5 a.m. Today, they're in Puerto Morelos, a small beach town about 25 miles from Cancun. When the first thing that happened to people was to complain. It smells bad, it smells bad, it has pulga, it has everything. Hotels pay them to get the seaweed off the beach and out of the view of tourists. They collect about 40 metric tons of sargassum every day, enough to fill two of these containers. The idea to turn seaweed into bricks came to Omar in 2018, when more than 50,000 metric tons of sargassum overran the coast. Al principio fue hacerlo de manera manual y artesanal, como se hacía el adobe. La impresión de ellos es, es no creer. Es como que, ¿cómo puede ser? Omar makes the bricks, which he calls sarga blocks, at his workshop, 10 minutes from the beach. Workers grind the dry sargassum into a fine powder by smashing it with rocks. Then they mix it with dirt, which Omar repurposes from construction sites. They shovel a mixture of sargassum dust and dirt through a grate to remove any large chunks. They mix the powder with water to form a thick paste. The exact recipe is a secret, but each brick is about 40% sargassum. Sargo blocks can also be recycled again and again. With this single machine, Omar can make up to 3,000 bricks a day. He developed eight prototypes before perfecting this one. Now, he's designing a bigger machine that could produce 8,000 bricks a day. He has six full-time employees making the bricks, and some help build homes, too. So sí es difícil, pero pues ahora sí que hemos visto la cara de las personas cuando se han donado luego casas o cosas así y te llena, ¿no? Esa parte, este, se te olvida lo, lo otro. Since 2018, Omar has built more than 40 homes. The first one is right next to his workshop. He named it after his mother. Aquí estamos en Casa Angelita, la primera casa en el mundo hecha a base de sargazo. When he was eight years old, Omar left behind a home just like this one to cross the Mexico-U.S. border with his mother. Esta casa me recuerda mucho mi infancia, mi niñez, ya que es una réplica de la casa de mis abuelos. En este lado era una cocinita, me acuerdo perfectamente, una sala comedor que se me hacía enorme y un baño. They wouldn't have a home of their own for the 30 years they lived in the U.S. El sueño americano es un sueño muy doloroso. Fue una vida complicada. Al, al vivir con una madre soltera, al, al no tener papá, al no tener un techo propio, uh, caer el tema de las adicciones, del alcohol, de la droga. Pero bueno, siempre tuve en mi mente y en mi corazón regresar a México. He finally returned to his home country for good in 2014 with just $55 in his pocket. He used it to start a business buying and selling plants. And he eventually saved enough money to buy this lot. Pues es que estando aquí, estoy en mi casa, no tengo miedo a nada. Developing Sarga blocks required a lot of trial and error. Pues mira, tengo en la mano el primer molde que utilizamos para los primeros adobes de, de sargazo. Omar's business is called Vivero Blue Green. He makes most of his money selling plants and from hotels paying him to clean up the sargassum. He also sells his bricks and builds houses. He has sold more than 20 homes and given away another 15. Omar admits the houses may not be fancy, but they are durable. Casa Angelita lleva cuatro años. Y la pueden ver, hemos tenido huracanes, tormentas tropicales, hasta la intemperie, y no ha pasado absolutamente nada. That's good news for Elizabeth del Carmen Bonola Lopez and her daughters. Their home was destroyed in a hurricane in 2021. Omar helped them rebuild it with Sarga blocks. Una palapa que se me estaba cayendo, que no tenía yo nada, pues es una casa de Sarga Block que nos sentimos seguras, mis hijas y yo contentas, felices. No huele mal, no trae bichitos, pues es más cómoda que cualquier casa, porque se ajusta al calor y al frío. Indeed, research shows that seaweed is a great insulator that keeps homes cool in the summer and stores heat in the winter. Usually Omar hears about people in need through a friend or a local. Ah, pero ver la cara de las familias felices, híjole, eso sí no tiene precio. And there's no lack of raw material. Over the past decade, 
Waves of sargassum have gotten so large you can detect them from space. In 2020, the Mexican government collected 19,000 metric tons of sargassum from Quintana Roo's beaches. In 2021, it collected twice that amount. Antes eran tres meses por año que se empezó a ver el sargazo, cuatro meses. Y ahorita hemos visto temporadas que hasta nueve meses nos ha llegado al alga. Studies show prolonged exposure can make it hard to breathe. In 2023, the Cancun Hotel Association set aside more than $20 million to remove it from beaches. And the problem goes beyond Mexico. The invasive weed has spread to shores across North America, in Florida, Texas, and other parts of the Caribbean. The exact cause of the increase isn't clear, but some experts blame high levels of nitrogen in the sea, a result of agricultural waste runoff and deforestation. So now, Omar's business is getting international attention. He's given TED Talks, appeared on Shark Tank Mexico, and traveled internationally to promote his product. Investors and businesses from over a dozen countries have reached out to learn from him. Omar is exploring licensing and franchising the Sarga Block recipe to other businesses. Elsewhere in Mexico, other entrepreneurs are experimenting with new ways to use sargassum, like making notebooks and even shoes. A British startup called Seaweed Generation is using sargassum to capture carbon and store it at the bottom of the ocean. Back in Mexico, Omar is simply grateful to be living in his home country, surrounded by the people he loves. And after work, he returns to a home he built himself using his own bricks. Omar hopes his success will inspire others. Así es que los mexicanos volteemos a ver hacia nuestro país, que volteemos a ver que también hay oportunidades. Si yo puedo, ustedes pueden hacerlo. Isn't it amazing when you put your mind uh, to good use, as I like to say, and, and you realize the potential in so many things that are around you? I mean, we complain about sargassum seaweed all the time, and I agree, it really is a hindrance to many microeconomies. However, there are benefits. Economies can be created from these little things as well, as exemplified uh, in Mexico, where they are now producing bricks. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, when you put your mind to good use, it's amazing what we can develop as human beings. So I'm gonna put my mind to good use right now and say let's take a break because when we come back, quite a riveting discussion to get into this morning. We'll be right back after this. back to the program ladies and gentlemen thank you for joining us i promise you a riveting discussion and i well I, i'm going to lead the discussion but the individual who can really get your mind running this morning as they did with i when i when i read the column essentially is miss denise deming she's an author she's a columnist she's a communication strategist and quite possibly somebody who has a plan who's not going to share that plan and say, <laughs> good morning miss deming how are you Good morning. And you started off by saying I have a plan? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a plan for a good discussion. So let, yes. let, let's, let's put it that way. I, I read um, with great interest your article, A Missed Opportunity for Change, where you reflected on the recently held interim elections of the United National Congress, but you also utilized themes from that election to the bigger picture of, of national development, where we are and where we're heading. Before I get into that, though, it's how you started the article that really had me kind of I was like, wow, you spoke about Father's Day and electing a woman uh, to lead the United National Congress. Well, why did you start your article that? What was the thinking behind this as being the most pertinent introduction? It's a very trivial kind of start of an article. But on Father's Day, we think of our men. We're supposed to think of our men, the people who have framed the way we are, the people who continue to support us and so on. And to me, fathers, there was an excellent opportunity to, to, to transform and move towards Rushton Parry's grouping, who, remember I had written earlier, telling him there's no way that he can try to transform without women. Mm -hmm. And then other things happened and you saw women join them. So on Father's Day, I said to myself, you know, hmm, maybe they'll select Rushton's team. 
They didn't. They went after a woman's team. Mm. And that is what made me say, well, how come is it on Father's Day we select a woman over a man? You know, so it was a very trivial approach. So that leads me to my next question, moving away from the trivia for a bit uh, and focusing on that theme of transformation. What, what do you think transformation is? And in the context of TNT, what should transformation be? Transformation is to change all your structure, systems, and processes to a very different approach. If we look at Trinidad at the moment, it will be very difficult to say that we're doing well, because we're not. If you listen to all the economists, they tell you all about the GDP and so on, which I have no real, real interest in. But what I have an interest in is our social development, our systems, our structures, our processes. I have tremendous interest in how do we make our people better? How do we ensure that you can, that you can walk through Trinidad and Tobago, anywhere in Trinidad and Tobago, without being worried about crime? And those are the things I'm interested in. The systems, the structures, the processes, I'm interested in crime, and I'm interested in the development of the people because if your people are not strong and they don't have a clear idea of what they want, then we will continue to have the mediocrity that we have. And sometimes when I describe it as mediocrity, I even think that the word mediocrity is too good to describe what is happening. Hmm. We are really at the bottom. Where does that mediocrity stem from though? Do you think it stems from within the general population? Do you think it stems from the top? Where does, where's the rooted? Mediocrity. The root of mediocrity has to do with the context in which you're operating. So the culture is what will determine mediocrity. And our culture is led by poor quality leaders. Leaders who have no difficulty breaking a traffic light because they have police with them. Now when a young person sees someone break a traffic light, they, they're not interested in, okay, but he has the police with him, so he can do it. They're not interested in that. What they're learning is you could bring a traffic light if you wish, you know. You go abroad to other countries. If that happens, it happens in a very, very um, defined way. There are other countries in which the politicians use the public transportation. So they don't, you don't see mm -hmm. them you know, give, give, giving themselves that opportunity. So it's always our leaders are people who see themselves as I am better than you, I, have, I deserve more than you. And you look at most of our leaders, what you see are people who have come from very terrible backgrounds. They have not been successful prior to their political career. And their people will challenge me on that, but look at the 41 and you will not find that the majority of them have been successful because of their political career. What we have are people who get into politics for what they can get out of it, both what they can get financially, because most of them, you look at them before they got into politics, they, they, where they lived was a normal house and so on. Mm -hmm. You look at them now and you see that they're living in a multi-million dollar house kind of thing, and you ask yourself, given the salaries that they get, how did they buy that? But we've accepted that as a norm, Ms. Deming. That, that just seems to be something that is, okay, it's given now. It doesn't seem to be much of an issue anymore. I have not accepted it, and I don't think I'm the only one. And I don't think we've accepted it. We've not accepted that you can, you can get anything you want simply because of where you are and who you are. You still have to work. If we want to change this country, everybody has to start working harder so that we teach our younger people that you, know, you need to work, you need to contribute in order for you to benefit. It can't be who you know. It can't be I have a contact, therefore I get a contract. It has to be that you deserve it because you, you can deliver on it, because you're good at what you're doing. We can't continue the way we are going. So then do you think that attitude has to a certain extent, uh, seen as accepting incompetence as well. Do you think that we have become so lost or, or no longer interested 
in what is taking place, that we are now accepting mediocrity and incompetence? I don't think we're accepting mediocrity and incompetence as a population. And I keep focusing on our leaders. I think our leaders are accepting mediocrity and incompetence because most of our leaders are not interested in putting the best resources to deliver. They get away with it. Why not, why not feed it to the population if it is that they get away with it? They get away with it, and that's where I keep pushing a needle into the population to say, listen, they can't get away with this. Let's transform our country. Let's change the way we do things. Let's ensure that we have respect for each other. Let's ensure that we recognize that competence and capacity is important. We cannot continue the way we are going. Mm -hmm. There has to be a major transformation. There has to be something that changes this country in such a way that we all begin to say, well, all right, I know what our goal is. I know what our vision is. I know what is the strategy that we're going to use. I know what the action is that I am supposed to be contributing. Strategy to action is important, but you can't get strategy to action if you don't have a vision. You just said there must be something. Do you think that we can afford to wait to find out what that is, or do we have to create that something ourselves? Listen, I don't have all the solutions. I don't have the solutions. <laughs> but what I am very clear about is if you want to if you want to change your life, for instance, if you are overweight. You cannot continue to eat what you're eating, drink what you're drinking, and the weight will go away. You have to change your diet. You have to determine, okay, I will have a little less sugar. I will have a little less of that simple carbohydrates. I will go to more compl complex carbohydrates and so on. So you will then transform your body. Mm -hmm. The society cannot change if we continue, and it's something I've been saying for a while, if we continue the way we have been functioning over the last 14 years, we will not change. And the reason I talk about the last 14 years is that that takes us back to, to 2010. It does when the UNC came into power, when the People's Partnership came into power. And then it took us to 2015 when the PNM came back into power. We've had nine years of the PNM, and I cannot say to you, this is something I'm proud of. Mm. Okay. And if you, you've taken a position that uh, you, you speak out mm -hmm. to a certain extent. You, you, you speak out, you express yourselves. That is something that I don't often see. I, mean, I see political commentary. I see people venting and expressing frustrations. But you're speaking out to an issue and you're trying to get to the, to the root of that issue. Generally speaking, the argument is now transformation is going to start with young people. We can no longer rely on the older generations and the older heads, it starts with young people. But do you think young people themselves are free to express their opinions and their thoughts? Many of them I've spoken to don't even want, who have the potential, don't even want to take leadership opportunities because of that fear associated with it. And that's an excellent question that you're asking me. And it's not an either or. It's not going to be just 50 young people will turn up and transform. There has to be collaboration. And when I talk about collaboration, I'm not only talking about political collaboration. I'm talking about collaboration between the young and the old. It, we can't, the young people won't just jump up. What they need is people whom they can follow, people whom they can look at and say, but listen, I don't agree with you, but here's my view. And we are able to talk about it and then say, well, okay, this is my view, that's your view. What is it that we can do to make things better? Mm -hmm. You know, and that approach to collaboration will make a difference. But it has to be an approach in which we respect each other and we're not just looking at, well, you did this and that was terrible or that was done and was terrible. We look at it as, okay, what is the outcome that we want to get from this activity? If you're not focused on the outcome, and I may be a little bit repetitive, eh? if you don't know where you want to go, then nothing you do makes a difference. Mm. Let me, let me <coughs> come back to what you said, that, that there's not one thing that you could point out that you're, you're proud of. If you're taking a look at the last nine, 10 years in particular, do you think that you would feel more proud if, and I'm speaking about specific now to currently what is being offered to us on either side, mm -hmm. I'm not speaking to one particular organization. Do you think you would be happy if there was a change in government given what it is that we're currently being offered? If we had a change in government mm -hmm. or governance? 
Well, <laughs> you, 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 you go ahead and answer. You go ahead and answer. If there was a change, I think that I would, if there was a change and depending on the outcome, that would make me feel happy. Listen, I'm very proud of my country. Trinidad is a beautiful place. I came in from Canada last night. Oh, thanks for coming this morning. <laughs> <laughs> a week ago, I was running around the Queen's Park Savannah and I tripped and fell because there's a piece of steel up projected up in, in this was in front of the White Hall, eh? Okay. <laughs> this was in front of White Hall. Very odd security mesh in front of White Hall. You know. And I fell and hurt my hip. While I was in Canada, I spent a lot of time just looking at the pavements. And it, I spent time looking at the pavements because of what I had just experienced. Now, that you may look at that as a very simple kind of, again, trivial example. But here's the issue with that. Whoever cut down the post that was there, nobody then went and supervised it and said, well, okay, for you to cut this down, you have to make sure that the entire pavement is flat. Mm -hmm. It can't be poking out. And that is an example of what happens in this country. People get something to do and they just do it. And nobody comes back and supervises it to say, well, okay, you've not completed this. And it's only complete when you've done X. Nobody does that. You look at all of our pavements and you see pieces of steel popping up that will impact disabled people, it will impact women who have, who have children in a stroller, it will impact a walker, it will impact a runner. I'll, I'll go one even better. You look at the roads and you wonder, oh look, piece of road missing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, I looked in, in Toronto, I looked at the roads. They are doing construction, right? But when they're doing construction, the way it is done, you understand it. System structures and processes are what we need. And that is what we do not have in this country. Do you, you think, do you think, it would be accepted if there was a push to change the norm. Yes, it, yes, there would be. If Here's an example I use. Many years ago, when we moved to seatbelts, in three months, people wore seatbelts. Huh? So that's a simple example that people are willing to transform, they're willing to change, if there are consequences. But if you feel that there are no consequences for anything you do, then you say, well, all right, now nah, it's okay. And no so and so, I could get through. You have to stop that. So, in the, in, and I'm speaking there right now to the context of the conversation. You said you love your country. I love my country as well. But do you think the more that you love your country, speaking about TNT, the more you become frustrated? Okay, I have been trying to manage frustration <laughs> for many years in this country, and one of the ways I manage please, it... Um, please share some advice. <laughs> one of the ways I manage it, two ways I manage it. I drink a lot of water. <laughs> that might sound as if, you know, what water has to do with it? Somebody has been listening to Soka. <laughs> <laughs> I do that a lot. And I do a lot of physical exercise, and that helps me with my frustration. And I also am very structured in my days. So when... There are days when, okay, I'm not listening to the radio, I'm not reading the newspapers because I have to do X, Y, or Z. Because if you continue to, to just listen and be part of it, you'll be frustrated and, you know, frustration is terrible. So you have to structure your day in such a way that you move away from them and their stupidness. And I mean, that's what I tell oh, myself. Okay, I hear you, but aren't you being a bit contradictory? We can't move away from the stupidness if we want to change. You have to be in control of you. So I haven't left the country. I'm not running away for five months. I'm running away for a couple hours. And if I can run away from a couple, for a couple hours and I'm not into all the foolishness that's happening, then I can relax and I can work on the things that I'm interested in as well. And then I jump back in and I jump back in and see the, the headline on crime has not changed. I've not read the newspaper for a week. Crime, crime, that headline has not changed. How are we going to continue to survive? Mm -hmm. You know, because for instance, crime in this country has to do with systems, structures, and processes. What are the systems to prevent the, 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 the guns from coming in? What have we done with the borders? Are we telling the population that in X year, X number of guns came in, but in this year, it's less? We can't tell them that, we don't have the data. So crime continues, and it continues in a way that makes 
at least it has made me, I'll give you another example, another example. I moved to Dago Martin 20 years ago, and I would leave my house at 4.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. and go for a run. Recently, I wanted to do a long run, and I spent so much time saying to my husband, I'm not sure that I could do that, you know. I'm a little worried and so on. And I eventually did what I normally do these days, jump in your car, drive to the Savannah, and then go for a run. Because I'm so afraid of the Dig Martin Main Road, a place where 20 years ago, I would run at 4, 4.30, and not feel terrible. When, when my parents would tell me that, you know, when they were growing up here in TNT, uh, and even my, my elder cousins, you know, who, who were, you know, just a few years older than I would tell me, growing up, we used to leave our doors unlocked. There was no such thing as burglar proofing, for example. Maybe you had your, your fancy windows and whatnot, but all this thing about raw tying and all that wasn't something that was a part of, of planning for your house or when you're building or you're renovating. I don't believe it. I find it hard to believe that there's been such a drastic change in such a short period of time, and then it's led to a great decline. It's very hard for me to digest, and I often wonder, have I missed out on the best that Trinidad has to offer? Maybe you have, in terms of, in terms of my generation, you've missed out on the best, but every generation has their best and your generation still has the opportunity to transform our country and experience the best. Mm -hmm. The best is contextual. The issue that your parents have talked about where it, we used to be able not lock the door and so on, I'll give you another example. <laughs> I lived in Chagonas for 18 years. When we sold the house, our biggest challenge in selling the house was finding the keys for the doors. <laughs> <laughs> because when you're selling a house, you have to give the people the keys. But living in Chihuahuas was so easy and so, it was comfortable that we didn't even have a problem with keys for the doors. Wow. You, 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 I've spoken about incompetence uh, and you referenced incompetence, but you keep speaking about structure as well. And I wonder if we often use incompetence as the, the most reasonable excuse. There seems to be a great lethargy and a lack of discipline. There, there is a lack of discipline, and I have not seen any governments, except under Car um, Carolyn Passard, was it? Was it? Carolyn C. Passard. Carolyn C. Passard, right? <laughs> when she was doing a process to transform the public service, I've not seen similar approaches, and the transformation of the public service to one in which that is customer serviced customer-oriented, transform one in which people respect each other. That is the kind of thing that the government, whoever is in government, that's the kind of thing you have to do because the public service is a major employer. If you transform them in terms of deliverables, it will impact the rest of the society. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that I think we need to do. Our police are not structured. Police do I don't know, they kind of do it, every, I feel to do this, I feel to, so they're not structured. If our police service was more structured, that would impact the society. Mm -hmm. You see people breaking traffic lights. Why do they break traffic lights? There are no consequences. You yeah. know, I see police, the police car parked by the corner and the policeman in his uniform lining up for doubles. How? One policeman for one police car. For <laughs> And this doubles he's going for. And you may be saying that I'm looking at little things, but those things bother me because if there's a system, a structure, and a process in which somebody knows exactly where that policeman is and what he's supposed to be doing, and there's a consequence, then he wouldn't do it. And if he's not doing it, then he may transform his own his own family. Yeah, but do we need somebody behind us with a big stick all the time? Right now, I think we do. <laughs> right now, our society has become so, I don't know, we need structures, we need people, we need consequences. So, I will, my, my final question to you is, you close mm -hmm. your, your, your call by saying, let's come together to do what is necessary to transform our country, our future depends on it. What is necessary to transform our country? Collaboration. Political and social collaboration is absolutely necessary to transform this country. We have to stop this 
um, political party based on race. We have to transform, we have to move away from that and we have to collaborate with each other. Look at our crime situation. The opposition and the government did not collaborate to come up with a crime plan. So when I talk about what needs to transform, it is collaboration, both politically and socially. What should future leadership look like in TNT? Future le leadership in TNT? Okay, 20% women, 20% men. There, there should be another 20% of one race, 20% of another race. So, so that do we, we really need to get it down to that? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Because you look at it at the moment, there aren't, you look, women are not, rec not recognized in this country. We need more women in leadership, but they're not there. Is it that they don't want to do it? Or is it that a lot of them still feel that, you know, you have to offer it to me, I'm not going to ask you for it? You know, so we need to transform by having more equity. We need to transform by having more diversity. And we need to transform by having more inclusiveness of the different things in our society. Mm. Mr. Ming, I want to thank you very much for your time this morning. I'm going to have to bring you back. That last, <laughs> that, that last uh, part of, of, of our conversation where you were speaking about what leadership should look like and you broke it down, that's a whole different topic that we have to get into some other time. So let me know when next you're traveling and I'll bring you back there next morning. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's quite amazing. You came back last night and you here bright and early this morning. Thank you very much. Uh, the average tree would not even show up because of the rain. You know, <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All the very best. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Many a times, I, I mean, I stressed on it earlier, we said, if you put our minds to good use, it's amazing what we can achieve here in TNT. But uh, I, I understand and recognize the message in respect to leadership, but new leadership has to rise and it has to rise with you, especially young people. I hope you're listening and I hope that you're getting rid of that fear to speak more and more openly. Well, that's it for AM Prime. Thank you very much to my guests and thank you very much to my dream team, Ryan Gomez, Burke and Mahal Redwood, as uh, we like to refer to. And thank you very much uh, for all your hard work and dedication. And ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the weather. Go to work now, please. I did it this morning and it was raining very heavily. And we'll see you again tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.